Fluid catalytic cracking has helped shape the modern world, but new standards, evolving demands, and diverse feedstocks are changing the petroleum industry. To create value, refineries need new solutions. Solutions that GRACE provides through our FCC catalysts. Backed by 75 years of experience and a global manufacturing network, GRACE is the world's largest supplier of FCC catalysts and additives. It's a leadership position we've reached through constant innovation, technical service, and an unwavering focus on value. As the world moves to more diverse sources of energy and chemical products, our team is finding FCC catalyst solutions for issues relating to petrochemical precursor production, feedstock diversity, environmental limits, and co-processing of bio-based feedstocks. In these changing times, we're committed to helping refineries succeed. Talent, technology, trust. That's how we deliver the science of solutions. Thank you very much for joining us today for our discussion of co-processing of bio-based feedstocks in the FCC. We're very excited to be able to share with you what Grace has learned over several decades of experience with renewable feedstocks and how we've helped multiple refiners around the world uh, execute uh, on co-processing projects around the FCC. Uh, my name is Bob Riley. I'll be presenting this uh, presentation with Dr. Ken Bryden. Uh, both of us work at Grace in the FCC business, uh, but we have tried to frame this presentation in a way where if you are considering co-processing of a renewable feedstock outside of the FCC, that this presentation may also offer some useful support for you. Grace has a long history with renewable feedstocks dating back to the 1980s when we introduced a material called Tricil, which is an adsorbent that's used to clean seed oils and animal fats for processing in the world of edible oils and fatty acid methyl ester biodiesel. That is the time that allowed us to start exploring the chemistry of renewable feedstocks uh, and to start making progress in their conversion, in understanding their conversion. Uh, in the early part of the 2000s, uh, we made another step forward when we started joining industry consortia to investigate the use of renewable feedstocks uh, in traditional refining processes. Uh, the purpose of the industry consortia was really to bring together the many different stakeholders uh, that can participate in the evaluation and the scale-up uh, of uh, renewable feedstocks in these processes. Uh, and we've repeated this several times over, over the years. Uh, in 2008, another major milestone, we licensed our first DCR, or Davison Circulating Riser pilot plant uh, to a licensee who was specifically pursuing a renewable uh, processing route. Uh, and we're very excited to have repeated this practice several times over to new licensees. Uh, this is a key uh, technology step to allow for the evaluation and scale up of new processes around renewable feedstocks. In 2010, we introduced the Enriched Catalyst Series, which today is used to clean uh, and to convert uh, oils in uh, renewable diesel processes. Uh, and then in 2011 to present, we've worked with many refiners all over the world to evaluate uh, and to support the use of renewable feedstocks in the FCC and in other units in the refinery. And that brings us to the position we are in today, where several GRACE customers around the world are producing of renewable feeds in the FCC and in other refining processes with the support of GRACE and other technology providers. We've seen that several steps are necessary when a refiner is considering the evaluation of a renewable feedstock uh, in the refinery. We'd like to break these up into four different major steps. Uh, and the first is the identification of the feedstock. In a moment, I'll talk about what a bio-based feedstock actually means uh, but this is the most important step in the entire process, determining what kind of feedstock you're going to process, what its availability might be, what uh, type of variation may exist in the quality of that feedstock. The second step, uh, and almost always uh, hand in hand with the first, is choosing a processing route. Will you choose an existing process? Will it be co-fed into the FCC? Will it be fed 100% into the FCC or into a different unit? Uh, what type of um, processing will you pick in terms of uh, campaign-based or continuous or, or something else? Uh, 
Um, and then maybe most importantly, what kind of regulatory environment exists in the area in which you're trying to execute the co-processing. Different regulatory environments reward different process routes differently. Understanding this up front is one of the most important aspects of choosing a renewable fuels process in the refinery. The third major step is scale up and testing. Grace has been very excited to apply our R&D, our knowledge and our expertise uh, to assist refiners in scale-up testing and evaluation and we'll show you exactly how we've done some of that work as we go through this presentation. And the fourth and final step in deploying a renewable feedstock process in the refinery is the permanent installation. This is where capital installation will occur, feedstock will be sourced and your process will be executed. And one of the important things here is to make sure that you've considered how to set up the right business processes to account for regulatory credits or to demonstrate compliance. I mentioned there's a lot of different things uh, that can constitute bio-based feedstocks. So you can see here a non-exhaustive list. Uh, we start with seed oils, animal fats, and used cooking oils. Uh, these tend to be what I, I'll lump into the triglyceride-based oils, or at least oils that were you know, once primarily associated with tri triglycerides. Um, these oils uh, tend to be one of the first examined uh, in the renewable uh, processing routes uh, because they are typically some of the most easily available oils through uh, supply chains that already exist. Uh, they also tend to be some of the easiest to process in, in certain routes. Uh, moving through the list, we have oils that can be extracted from biomass or even oils that can be created from biomass uh, with pyrolysis routes. Uh, these oils maybe represent the other end of the spectrum in terms of processing challenges. Uh, pyrolysis oil needs significant upgrading for easy treating uh, in the refinery, but has been evaluated even in its raw form for processing in different refining operations. And you can see the rest of this list has many other types of feedstocks, uh, and, and there are even others that are not listed here. Uh, the challenges associated with each of these feedstocks really depends on its specific properties, uh, the variation that's available in those properties, uh, and uh, the, even the time of year when uh, the feedstock might be created uh, can have an impact. Uh, most important takeaway from this slide, there is a huge variety of things that can constitute bio-based feedstocks. So understanding which ones you want to consider is really the most important upfront step. Here we have a selection of six representative bio-based feedstocks, just to give you a bit of a visual understanding of the wide range of the materials that you may encounter. On the far right, this is a traditional vegetable oil. As you can see, it's light and relatively low viscosity. The next sample here is an animal fat. We've actually heated this sample up above room temperature to get it to flow well Whereas for many animal fats, one thing you'll have to consider is that oftentimes at room temperature, they can set up and be solids. The third sample here is a pyrolysis oil. This is the lower phase of a raw pyrolysis oil. This will be a very high oxygen content material, and you can see here it has a relatively intermediate viscosity. Next to it, we have from making the same pyrolysis oil, the aqueous phase of that pyrolysis oil. This has a high water content, but it is still of interest for FCC co-processing because there's still quite a bit of biogenic carbon present in that aqueous phase. Now, these are unupgraded pyrolysis oils, and one feedstock you may encounter is a hydrotreated pyrolysis oil, like this one here. You can see that hydrotreating has lowered the viscosity, and we know that it increases the hydrogen content and reduces the oxygen content which will make this easier to process. And then finally, on the left hand side here, we have a tall oil from the wood products industry. You can see this has the highest viscosity of these samples at room temperature. And you can see this even better as we pour this material into this beaker. We've evaluated these and many other renewable samples for their suitability in the FCC, so hopefully this gives you an even better feel for the wide variety of properties that you'll see in bio-based feedstocks. 
Okay, I mentioned that the FCC is uh, often considered in co-processing, and one question we get is why? Why do we look at the FCC as one of the options? And the answer is that there are some fundamental aspects of FCC which make it an easy place to consider co-processing. Uh, there is a very large amount of flexibility built into today's FCCs based on the 80-year evolution of the process. From the unique heat management system, the heat balance, which really allows us to consider co-processing without needing to design around additional heat uh, removal or addition, uh, to sophisticated product treating systems downstream from the FCC, uh, but maybe most importantly, uh, there is a system uh, that can allow us to deal with catalyst contamination or catalyst deactivation events in an online manner. So if we do something to the process that uh, destroys the catalyst in a certain way, it can be addressed without having to take the entire unit down. And this is one thing that really differentiates the FCC from other processes that can be considered for uh, renewable feedstock co-processing. Okay, at this point I'd like to hand over to Ken to ask him to speak a little bit about the scale-up and testing work that Grace has done to support our customers in the processing of renewable feedstocks. Thank you, Bob. As mentioned in the introduction, I manage some of the testing labs at Grace. I'm going to be discussing one of the key steps in preparing for co-processing in a refinery. That step is characterizing the feedstock, understanding its chemistry, and also the yields it's going to produce. Now, you might ask yourself, why should I do any testing at all? Why not just purchase a rail car material and put it directly into a unit in my refinery? And the reason we want to test is we want to reduce risk. Uh, Leo Bakeland, who is a uh, pioneer in the plastics industry, uh, became a multimillionaire more than 100 years ago, was incredibly successful, was asked, you know, how did you achieve your success? And he said one of the reasons is he did a lot of pilot testing. He said he wanted to make his blunders on the small scale and make his profits on the large scale. So what I tell people is the lab where I work is where all the mistakes are supposed to happen. Things are supposed to go wrong. Things aren't going to work like planned. But that way you figure out what problems you have to solve to then make sure things go right at the commercial scale. In evaluating a new bio-based feedstock, there are a number of tests you want to do. One of the first set of tests you want to start with is characterizing the stability of the feedstock and also how it interacts with the petroleum feedstock already present in your FCC. For stability, you want to look at how thermally stable is the material and also does it age or change versus time. These are both important considerations in planning for the storage and the handling of the renewable material. Now, in addition to looking at stability, you also want to look at the interaction with petroleum-based material. You want to look and say, is this bio-based material miscible with the existing feed to the FCC? And also, what happens when I blend the two? Do I need deposits or precipitates form? Uh, as an example of what can happen, in the pictures on this slide, I have a uh, relatively light vacuum gas oil blended with a pine-based pyrolysis oil. And as you can see on the picture of the right, we form some uh, deposits and precipitates and sludge by mixing the two, even for a short period of time. So what this does is it gives you information saying, well, you know, maybe I need to consider a separate feed nozzle to the FCC, separate tankage for this material, and then also procedures to make sure I don't blend the two materials in my refinery. Now, after doing simple tests on the feedstock, we then want to do a detailed chemical characterization. Uh, we want to look at the uh, heteroatoms present and also the metals present. On this slide, I have a table presenting uh, the uh, typical median values for uh, FCC feedstock, along with ranges uh, commonly seen in refining. And for comparison, I have six different renewable feedstocks. And what you can see in this table is several key differences between renewable materials and petroleum-based materials. One of the obvious and most important ones is that most petroleum-based materials contain only trace levels of oxygen, whereas renewable feedstocks can have anywhere from 10 weight percent up to 50 weight percent oxygen. And this can result in uh, issues as you uh, make your downstream materials, whether or not you have uh, oxygenates present, whether or not you form phenols in your wastewater. Now, another key difference between renewable feedstocks and 
conventional petroleum-based feedstocks is the metals levels. As you can note in this table, renewable feedstocks tend to have much higher alkali and alkaline metals levels, uh, which can result in catalyst deactivation, and they can also have higher phosphorus levels. Now, one important thing to consider here and note is that even within the same type of feedstock, say soybean oil on the left-hand side of the table, there's a wide range of metals levels present. And you might ask yourself, well, why, why is that? Isn't it all just soybean oil? And there's actually very large differences depending on how that soybean oil has been processed. Uh, crude soybean oil that's just been pressed has very high levels of contaminant metals. If it goes through a degumming process, depending on the type of degumming process, the metals level will be lowered. And then if it goes through, say, a refining or purification step, the metals level will be lowered even further. However, as you can imagine, increasing processing is also going to increase the cost of that feedstock. So one of the things you have to do when looking at a renewable feedstock is assess what the metals effect is going to be. And the graph on this slide presents a uh, case study where we have a uh, bio-based feedstock with 75 parts per million contaminant metals. And we're looking at how are the metals on equilibrium catalysts going to change, which is presented on the uh, y-axis, the added metals to the equilibrium catalyst, versus both the percent of bio-based feed on the uh, x-axis, and then also what the replacement rate of the catalyst in the FCC is, as you can see the different cases here. And what you can note is depending on the uh, replacement rate of the catalyst, even at a relatively low weight percent of bio-based feed added to your FCC unit, you can have an increase in contaminant metals of more than one weight percent of your FCC catalyst, depending on the scenario. So what this means in practice is you have to consider potential mitigation strategies. You have to think about, am I going to manage catalysts differently? Perhaps use a purchase decap or perhaps uh, formulate the catalyst to a slightly lower activity but increase the catalyst addition rate. Uh, you also have to think about maybe you want to apply a metals tolerant catalyst technology and then also consider the uh, economic trade-offs of doing increased feedstock pretreatment before you send the renewable feedstock to the FCC unit. Now, once the feedstock's been characterized, another thing we like to do is determine what yields that feedstock is going to produce. We do that at GRACE with a variety of types of uh, lab and pilot plant equipment. Uh, for smaller scale, we like to do single receiver short contact time MAC testing. Uh, what this is is a uh, simple test that only requires a uh, few grams of feedstock, a few grams of catalyst. All the products are collected in a single glass receiver with a waterless collection system. And what this allows us to do is measure the oxygenates produced uh, by the cracking of the biomaterial and get an understanding of you know, where is that oxygen going to go uh, when we co-process a renewable feedstock. As we go up in scale, the next uh, type of equipment we like to use is uh, ACE. It's a, a fixed fluidized bed uh, catalytic cracking unit. Uh, it takes several grams of feed, several grams of uh, catalyst. It's a rapid way of determining what uh, yield a uh, feedstock is likely to produce. And then as we go to the largest scale, we like to use our uh, DCR circulating pilot plant. And what this is, is basically a mini FCC unit. Uh, we process about one kilogram of feed per hour, and it's a continuous process. We have a, a riser reactor where the uh, feedstock, the regenerated catalyst, and uh, atomization steam all come together. The reaction takes place as we travel up the riser. Uh, the products are then stripped from the catalyst in a steam stripper. Uh, products are collected and condensed for further analysis. And then the coke catalyst goes from the stripper to the regenerator where the coke is burned off. And just as in a conventional unit, the uh, regenerated catalyst comes right back around again to the bottom of the riser to start the process over. And Doing continuous processing on the pilot scale gives you a number of advantages. Uh, first, you can produce large quantities of liquid product. And examples of why you might want to do that are, one, you might want to do things like uh, cetane testing of the LCO. You might want to do engine octane testing for the uh, gasoline and fractions. And then another thing you might want to do, which is very important for renewables processing, is understanding where the carbon 
it's biogenic, is going. So oftentimes you'll want to do carbon-14 analysis uh, both on the liquid product and also cuts of the liquid product along with the gases produced in the, in the process. And you want to do this because in most regulatory structures for renewable credits you have to account for where the renewable carbon from your feedstock winds up in the products. Now in addition to producing uh, large quantities of material for testing, uh, continuous processing also has the advantage that it allows you to identify operability challenges that may occur in commercial practice. Now, some examples of the operability challenges we found in our experience are shown on this slide. Uh, on the top here, I have some examples of uh, destroying pumps. Uh, on the uh, upper right-hand side is a picture of a drive shaft of a pump. And what was happening is uh, I was processing a mixture of just a normal vacuum gas oil mixed with a uh, raw pine-based pyrolysis oil. I didn't realize at the time that the two materials were incompatible. And over time, we started forming a uh, deposit or a gum from the mixture of the two. Uh, this deposit got into the gears of a gear pump. Uh, the gears locked together. Uh, the motor of the pump was still turning and something had to give, and it was the uh, drive shaft of the pump. Now, another example is uh, shown on the upper right where we were processing 100% uh, pyrolysis oil, and what happened there is a similar situation. The uh, gear pump locked up, and the failure point was the drive strap of the pump. Now, in addition to these type of simple operability issues you can identify, there are also longer-term things you may want to take a look at, like the possibility of corrosion. And Grace has done work in partnership with uh, Oak Ridge National Lab and Pacific Northwest National Lab uh, looking at how different stainless steels might be corroded in an atmosphere in an FCC unit that involves co-processing a uh, pyrolysis oil. And one of the publications from that work is shown at the bottom of this slide. Now, Grace's long-term experience with renewable feedstocks it's allowed us to support co-processing initiatives both in the lab and in the field. And some examples of this support are we've participated in industry consortiums with both the uh, United States Department of Energy and also with the uh, European Commission. Uh, we have licensed our technology to those working on biomass processing. And then also we focused our R&D and technical resources to enable co-processing. Uh, we've done feasibility reviews for refiners. Uh, we've done characterization of new feedstocks. Uh, we've done lab testing to understand potential yields and also potential operability issues. And then our field technical support staff have worked to support deployment of renewable feedstocks and also identifying and addressing potential challenges that could occur downstream from the FCC when you're processing renewable feedstocks. Grace has supported numerous refiners in co-processing renewable materials. And this slide is a high-level summary of our experiences and observations. For animal fats and vegetable oils, they're typically easy to process without major problems. And there's several refiners running these materials regularly. For pyrolysis oils, they can be a very challenging feed to process. And for the many other renewable streams that are out there, it's a mixed bag. The answer is it depends, and that's just because of each of these materials has a different, unique chemistry which will affect how easy it is to process. Now, while every biofeed is unique, there are a few common things that you should watch out for. Uh, the first of those is metals levels. Uh, typically, biomaterials will have higher sodium, calcium, potassium, and magnesium than uh, petroleum-based feedstocks. This will result in accelerated catalyst deactivation. The phosphorus in renewable feedstocks typically isn't a problem in the FCC unit at low levels, but it can cause fouling downstream and also poison hydroprocessing catalysts. The oxygen in renewable feedstocks can cause a number of issues. It can increase oxygenates in your liquid products. It can create increased oxygenates in your LPG stream. And it can also result in increased phenols in your wastewater. Now, for some of the more difficult to process feeds, you can also see things like nozzle fouling, increased coke production, and even an increased possibility of corrosion. Well, renewables co-processing has its challenges, 
it can be successfully done. Grace is currently supplying and supporting multiple refiners in both Europe and North America who are routinely co-processing renewable feedstocks. As one example, the graph in the lower right of this slide shows the percent of bio-based feedstock over the last two years going to the FCC for one of our customers. And as you can see, over the last two years, they've been able to increase the renewables they're processing, and they're currently routinely processing more than 10% renewables to the FCC. GRACE has supported and enabled renewables co-processing through both our catalyst technology and through our technical services. Now, in addition to the customers we're supporting who are currently commercially co-processing renewables, we're also working with a large number of refiners who are in the evaluation stage of new bio-based feedstocks, helping them through both feasibility studies and through lab testing. Now, in conclusion, Bob and I would like to say that the flexibility of the FCC makes it a logical location for co-processing renewable feedstocks. You want to do lab and pilot testing to reduce risk. Uh, renewable feedstocks can be successfully co-processed in the FCC, and GRACE is routinely supplying multiple customers around the world who are co currently co-processing more than 10% renewable feedstock to their FCC units. I want to thank you for your attention, and Bob and I look forward to talking with you during the question and answer part of this seminar. The invention of fluid catalytic cracking revolutionized the way we make fuel and petrochemicals. But as modern needs and feedstocks evolve, refineries have to keep up. And that's a challenge. A challenge that Grace's research, technical service, and global customer technology teams are helping to solve. As the first FCC catalyst company to provide technical services, Grace works with refineries all over the world. They turn to us because our team has extensive, hands-on experience with FCC operations, unit design, modeling, and troubleshooting. And because our analytical capabilities are second to none. We have state-of-the-art laboratories located on three continents, supporting our team with industry-leading analytical methods and test units, including our Davison Circulating Riser Units, the world's leading circulating FCC pilot plant. Talent technology, trust. That's how we deliver the science of solutions.